uh, the game of rugby to me today, so I'm ready for tonight. Uh, it's not called the touchdown, it's called the try. It's only worth five points. And, uh, the field goal is still called a, field, a conversion. It's worth two instead of one. So I'm ready. Uh, I'm still trying to figure out. They didn't explain to me the scrum yet. Is that what it's called? Where they're just uh, going at it. All right, so each of us has days in our life that we will never, ever, 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 ever forget. Uh, days that are truly... Um, awesome and unforgettable or potentially terrible and you'll never forget those as well. February 26, 2015 was an unforgettable day uh, for you and for me potentially. No, for me and for you potentially. Other way around. Can I get some mercy? Now, uh, I remember exactly where it was. I was sitting at my desk and I hear our, our secretary scream at the front. She says, are you serious? You're insane! And I walk in and I'm going, what is going on? There's a riot that's about to happen in our office. And she goes, not a chance! And I'm going, what is happening here? And she says, it's white and gold! And then someone else comes in and says, are you insane? No, it's not. It's blue and black. Maybe you know what I'm talking about, but long story short, the story is a girl named Grace Blesdale was having a disagreement with her mom over the dress that her mom was planning to wear to her upcoming wedding. The disagreement became so strong that Grace then did what any normal kid would do and bashed her mom on Facebook saying, what color is the dress, you know, in reality? People started voting and within 24 hours, millions and millions of people had voted on what color the dress was and they used different hashtags. Hashtag white and gold, hashtag blue and black, and the dress gate to discuss their opinions on what color the dress was. Do we have that real quick? Okay, so let's turn out the lights real quick, Katie. It's my wife. Marrying her was also a big day. All right, so uh, here's the dress. Um, you Keep it there for a second. Now, we all know what, all born-again believers know what color it is. It's white and gold. Now, okay, so here are the polls. I know. All right, real quick. Let's just settle, let's settle it. Blue and black, where you at? All right, praying. Okay. All righty, all righty. White and gold, where you at? All right, I just, I saw at least 25 of you raise your hand both times. You're liars. Now, listen, okay, so 50% voted blue and black, 30% white and gold. Amongst those 30% that voted white and gold, predominantly it says uh, female senior citizens and your boy Johnny voted white and gold. 50% blue and black, 10% blue and brown, and 10% can uh, see both blue and black and white and gold. 20% hear both Laurel and Yanni. Now, uh, the world was in a confusion. Thank you. Uh, and then, Gary, I'm good in the picture. Uh, the world was in a confusion. So what they did is they started saying uh, and demanding on Twitter... Uh, a platform that needs to be taken seriously. They demanded that the designer of the dress come out once and for all and declare what color the dress actually was because people were frustrated. Now, I realized when I was 12 years old that I was colorblind, so I was like, I don't really know, I'm lost anyway, but I know it's white and gold. Now, people started demanding, come out, declare what color the dress is once and for all. People on Twitter said, quote, if the designer comes out, then the madness will stop. Please, please stop this madness. Someone else said that the dress had taken up a mind of its own and had come to planet Earth to torment the minds of humans. Now, here's what happened. The following day, Roman originals who created the dress, um, they came out with the following tweet and said, we will tell you what the color of the dress is. It is, quote, blue and black. And then they said, dot, 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 we should know dot, 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 we made it. Now, what happened is people started doing all these different science projects on it, writing different articles. Here's my boy, uh, Jay Neitz. He says, uh, the difference in opinion are a result of how the human brain perceives color and chromatic adaption. Other scientists concluded that we have learned, what we have learned from the dress gate is that we simply cannot trust our own perception, and that is because our perception can be distorted and affected by so many other factors. Now, people, after the designer came out and said, hey, Guys, it's blue and black. They started writing all these articles and blogs. I'm kind of sick of blogs. Now, they started writing all these blogs and articles and science projects refuting what the designer had actually declared the color of the dress to be. So they're doing science projects like, no way. But the designer's like, no, dude, I took this piece of black fabric and this piece of blue fabric and I wove them together. But people disagree. And basically what happened at the end, it says that, uh, this is a New York Times article, and they said, that what we have learned is that we cannot agree on things that are even definitive by the designer. 
Now, this is true in regards to what color dresses are, but this is also true in regards to how we define and what we talk about in regards to sin. That culture tries to define what sin is, and they come in and compare it and contrast it to the world around them. But when it comes to our understanding of sin, it can't be compared to what other people are voting or talking about or writing about or blogging about. Our understanding of sin needs to be received by the designer. And in a, in a quest of cultural sensitivity, here's what we've done. We, we've diminished the value of sin, and we've started voting on, hey, no, this is sin to me, this is sin to you, it's not sin to that, that's not sin, that's not sin, that's not wrong, that's not wrong. But the designer has spoken. God speaks to us every single day in his word. And you and I don't need to make the Bible come alive. We need living ears to hear. And so when God the designer comes and clearly communicates what sin is to you and me, it's the definition of stupidity, stupidity to refute what the designer has said. And so we need to understand who we are in light of a holy God and what sin is as the designer has defined. That's what we need more than anything. And the definition of foolishness is to refute what God has said. And so that's why when it comes to God's word, we need to dial in. We need to dial in. And the story that we're going to look at tonight, Jesus creates the ultimate sinner. He creates the worst of the worst. And here, uh, here we're going to dive in. If you guys have your Bibles, turn back to Luke 15. Remember where we were picking up from uh, this morning. We're going to be in verse 11. Culture may argue, but the designer gets the final word regarding sin. And here Jesus creates the ultimate sinner. And although not everybody sins to the extent of the prodigal, we're going to see that ultimately we're all put on an equal playing field sooner than later. Now, when we come to the story, and while you're turning there, there's a couple things that we have to understand about Luke 15. I hear a lot of people that try to like put Luke 15 or the parable of the prodigal son, but it's really not into like a, a cultural equivalent saying, a man owned a bunch of hotels, and his dad said, you know, his son said, give me my share of the hotels, and they try to like make some sort of cultural equivalent to what the prodigal son would be, but we can't really do that because there's something that we're disregarding then about the story, and maybe it's super familiar to you, or maybe it's the first time that you've heard it. One of the things that you and I have to understand as we approach this parable is that it's written in an honor-shame mentality. Now, we live in 2019. The story was communicated by Jesus 2,000 years ago to a Middle Eastern audience. The Bible was not written in English, and it wasn't written to you and me. It's not like Jesus was Snapchatting his disciples and doing, like, different TikTok dances, you know, as he, like, walked through the streets of Jerusalem. No, like, we have to understand the audience that Jesus is talking to in order to grasp the gravity of what he does and what he communicates as he goes through the story. And one of the biggest things in that is what I mentioned. It's an honor-shame paradigm. These people had a very, like, subconscious reality of, like, you only did, you only did what brought you honor. You never, ever ever did anything that brought you shame. Never. Never. And these were big things. And it says that the scribes and Pharisees, the scribes are the people that were basically writing the text, and they were kind of aligned with the Pharisees. And everything Jesus is about to say is so counterintuitive to their way of thinking that it just would have been, in New Zealand terms, a shaka. It would have been a shocker, shocking from start to finish. Have you guys seen like Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs? You know, and they're like looking up at the sky and they're going, <gasps> and that's like the whole time, the whole time the Pharisees would have been responding to Jesus going, what is this guy saying? He's out of his mind. It's a head shaker and an eye roller. They're going, what is this guy talking about? Verse 11 of Luke 15. He said, a man has two sons, had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, father, Give me the share of the estate that falls to me. So he divided his wealth between them. Immediately, the Pharisees around Jesus would have been going, what? It says, Father, give me the share of my estate that falls to me, of the estate that falls to me. And what they would have expected is that the guy would have just punched him in the dome and been like, get out of here, you idiot. But it's going, the father then, it says, divided the property between them. Now, you, maybe you've heard this before, but when he's asking, he said, give me this inheritance. Give me what I, what I would get. He's saying, God, I want you, or Father, I want you dead. It'd be better for you to be dead right now so I can have my stuff. I want my stuff, so go die. Give me the stuff that belongs to me, potentially, in the will. When do you receive a will? Upon someone's death. He's saying, I don't want any relationship with you. I only want the stuff that you can give me. I don't care about any intimacy with you. Give me the stuff. 
He doesn't care about his relationship with his father. And so at this point, in an honor-shame world, the Pharisees surrounding Jesus would have been like, what? What is going on? And then it says, an even more shocking thing, it says that the father responds, not by beating down his son, it says that the father then divided the property between them. Them is the older son and the younger son. So we continue to read here in verse 13. And not many days later, the younger son gathered everything together. One thing, as we know it, as we read through the Bible, sometimes we miss a lot because we just read it quickly. And many days later, now when you're talking about a rich family, a wealthy family, especially in the Middle East, when it says and not many days later, one of the things that we have to assume is, hey, how do you sell an estate quickly? How do you gather the assets? It's not like he's taking out his piggy bank and being like, hey, son, here's some money for you. No, he's going, I want, I want it to be cash. Give me the cash. How do you get rid of a lot of property quickly? You sell it at a fat discount. It's a fire sale. And they're going, why is the father doing this? Why is the father allowing his son to be so foolish, so shameful, and why is he obliging this? And so he sells it quickly so that he goes, not many, not many days later, the younger son gathered everything together and went on a journey into a distant country. He wanted to be as far away from his father as possible. No relationship, no accountability. He doesn't want anybody looking over his shoulder. He wants nothing to do with the father, nothing to do with his family, nothing to do with his heritage. He wants out. It's not like he's like, hey, I'm moving over there to the other side of the yard and I'm bringing my tent and my stuff. And he, every day he sees his dad at breakfast and he's like, hey, dad, I hate you. No, he's like far country. He went on a journey. He's packed his stuff. He takes the cash and he bails. He bails. He's gone. It says then, and there, verse 13 at the bottom, he squandered his estate with loose living. Now, one thing, by the way, later on in the passage, verse 24, it says that my son was dead when, when the father talks about his son. My son was dead and now he's alive. In an honor-shame culture, and I've been to these cultures all around the world, when someone denies the family, there is a funeral held for that son. A funeral's held. They wear black. They go, hey, this guy's dead to us. He's dead. He's denied the family. He's denied the father. He's denied a relationship with us. He's gone. And it says that he squandered his life or his wealth in loose living. If you look at the Bible down at verse 30 of the same chapter, the older brother says, but when this son of yours who has devoured your wealth with prostitutes you killed the fattened calf, and we'll come back for that tomorrow. But it says that this is not only just loose living. He's indulging in prostitution. He is at the bottom of the bottom. He is the worst of the worst. And in the mind of Jesus, or the people around Jesus, he's created the worst sinner imaginable. The worst sinner imaginable. Now, Verse 14 says, Now when he had spent everything, a severe famine occurred in that country, and he began to be impoverished. Now a lot of things were his fault at this point. He denied his father, denied the relationship, denied his family. But this one was not his fault. It says that a famine arose in the country. And I don't know if you've ever like, read anything about like a famine in, in um, early centuries. It, it would be like they were eating sandals, eating trees, whatever it was. Like famine's not like, eh, they're out of bread at the grocery store. We're going to like, we're going to get Mexican food tonight. You know, it's like, it's not like that. It's like, yeah, this place is closed on Sunday. Better go eat a pastry instead. No, these people are dying. So they're dying. So it says that he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens, verse 15 of that country, and he sent him into the fields to feed swine. I don't know what you know about the Jewish people, but do you know about their relationship with pork? Non-existent. And so when he goes, hey, they're going to feed the pigs. This guy, the son of yours, is now feeding pigs, and he's shoving his face in between the snouts of the pigs that he's feeding in order, in order to stay alive. And these people around Jesus are going, what? What? No honor. What a shameful son. What a shameful son. He's competing with the pigs for food. This can't be. This can't, cannot be. 
And it says, verse 16, and he would have gladly filled his stomach with the pods that the swine were eating, and no one was giving anything to him. It's his life at the bottom. Verse 17, but when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired men have more than enough, but I am here dying with hunger. We'll stop there for, for the night in, in, our, in our story. Here's what you and I need to, to look at. Look at it says, it says, when he came to his senses. Other translation says that when he came to the end of himself. Remember this morning I was talking about things that Jesus is going to continue to beat home throughout the Bible. It's this idea right here. When he came to the end of himself, when he came to his senses. Flip over a couple, a couple chapters later to Luke 18. Jesus tells another story that has the same idea. He tells the story of two guys, again, Pharisee and a tax collector. It says, and he told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and viewed others with contempt. Two men went into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. Remember, where the Pharisees are the good guys, you know, gold chariots, fish stickers, tax collectors, they stink. The Pharisee stood and was praying to himself, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, swindlers, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I don't even think this is a bad prayer. He's going, God, I thank you. I thank you, God, that I'm not like other people. Maybe you've prayed this prayer in your own life. You go, hey, God, I look at these other people. I'm glad that you saved me from the progression of my life and what I would have become if I had just gone full headlong into sin. Full headlong into sin. Like the prodigal. Like the prodigal. I'm, I'm thankful, God. I'm not like that guy. Verse 12, I fast twice a week of Luke 18. I pay tithes of all that I get. Not only does he do the religious stuff, it's not like I go to church every Sunday. He's like, I'm there every day. I vacuum every single day. Like, I'm doing the good stuff. I not only give what I have to give, I give over and above. All right, I like this guy. He's, and you know, he's, and I think it's fine because I have people I went to a Christian school with and I go, God, I thank you that I'm not like that guy. I thank you for saving me from the progression of my life. I could have been that guy, but I'm not. Verse 13 says, but the tax collector standing some distance away was even unwilling to lift up his eyes to heaven, but was beating his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. It's the same idea. Another guy, another terrible sinner that had come to the end of himself. This is what Jesus drives home over and over again. He's beating the same drum. It's a guy that's over there. He's not close like the Pharisee. It's a guy over there and he's saying, God, be, be merciful to me, a sinner. It says he's unwilling to lift his eyes to heaven. He's unwilling to look God in the face because he, like the prodigal, had come to the end of his senses. It's another guy that's the worst of the worst. And he says, I can't look up to heaven. I can't acknowledge God. But all he does is he says, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Now, the Pharisee would have obeyed everything. He had all the things dialed. He had kept every rule. He knew every, he knew every law. He had memorized the Bible. These were Pharisees had memorized the Torah, which would have been the first five books of the Bible. By the time they were young teenagers, they knew the word of God. They knew the word of God. Here's verse 15, or uh, Verse 14, he says, I tell you, this man went home to his house justified. Now, grammar can sometimes be scary because this is the scariest comma that you see in the Bible because if this was just a period instead of a comma, we could go home and say, hey, praise God that he saves even the tax collectors. But it's not a period, it's a comma. It says that this man went home justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. So here's what Jesus does. Remember, he's shattering misconceptions. He's saying, hey, Luke 15, I present to you the worst of the worst. He comes to the end of, his, the end of himself, that he comes to his senses, and he realizes that he is miserable. Not merely miserable because of the famine, miserable because of his sin, because of the condition of his heart. He realizes what is happening on the inside is really what's worse than anything. It's not his circumstances that drive him to his misery. It's the recognition of his sin, his alienation from his father, the, the kind of the dissolving of that relationship. And here we see someone that's on the totally fl total flip side of things. It's not a prodigal. It's a Pharisee. And Jesus says, I tell you that this man went home justified rather than the other. It's saying that now the tax collector gets in and the Pharisee is denied by God. Now, let me play this out in a story, but before I do that, let me tell you about Halloween. Halloween, do you guys celebrate that here? Satan's birthday, anybody? Okay, so on uh, October 31st in the States, we dress up and we do different things. I dress up as Larry Bird every year. Now, it's a basketball player from the Celtics. And we, go, we used to go, you know, people go trick-or-treating. But growing up, uh, because I, 
I honor God. I did not celebrate that, that pagan holiday. Now, when kids would come and knock on the door, they'd be like, da, 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 da. I would stand at the door and go, hey kids, happy Halloween, here's a Bible track. Now, that's what Patty had me do. That was my mom. Now, in the Bible track, one of the first things it says is, if you were to die today, where would you go? It's kind of a scary question to give a five-year-old. You know, like, hey, what's up, Leonardo, Ninja Turtle? Where are you going if you die tonight? <laughs> you know, like, so there we go. And, and one of the questions, but we'll, we'll take that example and we'll apply that to our story now. So we have the worst of the worst in the prodigal. He's with prostitutes. He says, Dad, I hate you. You freaking stink. Give me my money. I want my money and I'm going to go spend it on loose living, drugs, prostitutes, whatever that might be. Okay? That's the tax collector. That's the prodigal. The worst of the worst is over here. Then we see in this story that we have the best of the best mixed with the worst of the worst. And this is what Jesus does over and over and over again because we have to understand it because we're going, I'm not the prodigal, but dial in. All right, so let's take it. Pharisee and the tax collector are on their way home. We'll take our question from my Halloween track. And they get run over by Ben-Hur on the way home. Rogue chariot tramples both of them. Now they meet God face to face and the angels bring in the Pharisee and they bring him to God and say, hey, uh, they say, why should God let you into my heaven? Okay. And the Pharisee goes, ah, thanks for asking. Because of your grace and because I have done this, I'm not an adulterer, I'm not a swindler, I'm not a liar, I'm not a thief. I know your word and keep your word. I've memorized it. I love the church and I've been devoted to it my entire life. And... Uh, been faithful to my wife and because of all these things uh, you should let me into your heaven God looks at him and says get out get out tax collector he doesn't come in he doesn't walk in he doesn't stroll in he's dragged tax collector is dragged bring before God the Father, and he says, why should I let you into my heaven? He goes, no, 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 nothing. I have nothing. What? Speak. What do you got? What do you got? Nothing. I, nothing. I have nothing to say there. For no good reason should you ever let me into your heaven. For no good reason at all, uh, unless by some unfathomable act of mercy and grace from God, uh, I plead the blood of Jesus Christ. I plead the blood of Jesus Christ. And Jesus looks at the worst of the worst and says, come on in. Come on in. Um, you sit right here, you're my son, and that guy, he's out here. And the Pharisees are gathered around Jesus in these three consecutive, these stories in Luke 15 and Luke 18, and they're going, what is this guy talking about? It's not the good that are in and the bad that are out. It's not the church that are in and the unchurched that are out. Jesus tells us who's in and who's out. Verse 14. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. But he who humbles himself will be exalted. Jesus shatters misconceptions. And the misconception, first of all, is that we begin to think in our own mind, although theologically we might disagree, deep in our heart, we're like the Pharisee, many of us. And we go, hey, because of your mercy, your grace, and because I've gone to church and know the answers, that was the one, I've memorized the verses, I, I've done whatever. I've honored my father and mother, and uh, that's why you should let me in. And God says, hey, your heart's far from me. Matthew 7, many, many will say, Lord, Lord, and I'll say, I never knew you. So we look at the prodigal and we go, hey, that guy's far from God. But what Jesus does over and over again in the Bible is he, so, he shows two sides in two different ways to be equally alienated from God. One is the prodigal, and one is the Pharisee. Both are equally alienated from God. One over here obviously recognizes their need for a Savior, recognizes their, their lostness. The other one over here doesn't necessarily need to repent of their badness, but needs to repent of their goodness that thinks that earns them credibility with God. And Jesus says this side is way more dangerous. And so what the Bible does over and over again is it takes you and I and it deconstructs our conceptions regarding sin. You and I don't get to define sin and we don't get to define God because God's already defined himself and has already defined sin in his word. And so when we look at the Bible as a relevant document or not relevant and then we start to diminish the value of sin because we diminish the holiness of God, we're, we have a massive predicament on our hands. God says, okay, Biblically speaking, in my sight, you and I are all 
born with the same problem. We are born, Ephesians 2, 1, dead in our trespasses and sins. Do you know what the dead can do? Nothing. You know, in Princess Bride, it says this guy's only mostly dead. Mostly dead is slightly alive. That's the way you and I view our sin. We go, that guy's dead, dead, but I'm kind of slightly alive. I'm mostly dead, but slightly alive. Jesus says, no, all of you are dead, dead in your sin. And people go about that in two ways. One is moral conformity. One is moral abandonment. Both are equally alienating themselves from God. Equally alienating themselves from God. And Jesus comes in and says, hey, I'll tell you what. Before me, Romans 3.23, and you guys maybe know it, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But that's not just a fact that we need to memorize. It's something that we also need to sense. The gospel can only move in and be good news if you realize the bad news. And the bad news is not just via fact, I'm only human, I'm a sinner. The bad news is what you and I have to get to a position of is when we come to our senses, our senses and realize and recognize our lostness, that we are far from God, that we are lost in our sin, that we are dead in our sin. Psalm 51.5 says that we are born and conceived in iniquity. And so what the Bible hammers and drums over and over and over again is that whether it's Hank or Hitler or Heidi, we're all put on an equal playing field before a holy God, equally in need of a Savior. We all need a Savior, and we're all put there. Romans 3.19, every mouth will be stopped before a holy God. And what Jesus communicates to us is, hey, whether you're the prodigal or whether you know every answer and you're a church kid, you equally need a Savior. And if you come to Jesus professing your own dignity and good deeds, you are further away from God than the prodigal and much, much, much more in a dangerous position. Jesus says we have to recognize this we have to recognize this. Look back to Luke 15, and we'll see what the prodigal is about to say. Luke 15, verse 17, he said, How many of my father's hired men have more than enough, but I am dying here with hunger? I will get up and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and, into, and in your sight. This is one of the things that maybe you and I miss is who our sin is ultimately against. He says, I've sinned against heaven. Your sin and my sin is not so much against other people as it is against God himself. I mentioned it this morning, and your problem and my problem are not merely the things that we do, but it's who you are. You sin because you are a sinner. You are not a sinner because you sin. You sin because you are a sinner you do not, and not the other way around. Does that make sense? You do what you do because you are who you are. And who you are is a sinner. You are born in iniquity. Adam's sin brought in sin for you and for me. What that means is, I'll, I'll explain it this way. The way that I, we typically communicate sin to students, and this is what I, I hate doing and I'll never do again, is they go, how many of you guys have told a white lie? And the students will raise their hand and be like, nah, you know what that is, that's the sin. And the Bible says, liars get punished. But that's, that's not really the total truth. The total truth is, from the moment that you first take a breath, we are born separated from God. You are not just what you do, you are who you are, and who you are is born in sin, conceived in iniquity, and alienated from the God who gave you life. And so you do what you do, and you see the sin around, you see the pain and guilt and suffering, whatever that might be, as a result of sin, but all that it does is revealing, all that it's doing is revealing who you are in your very core, and what the Bible says, and, and I think that sometimes I have to start apologizing to God instead of apologizing for God is what is the consequences of those sin. We start going like, hey, I'm not going to... I think here, here, I get asked a lot if I can start saying separation from God as the punishment for our sin. What the Bible says so clearly is that the wages of sin is death in Romans 6.23. And what Jesus says, Jesus, the God of love, and he is so loving, we'll talk about this tomorrow, Jesus says in Luke 12, I will tell you who to fear. Fear the one whom after he has died can cast, you, you have died, can cast both body into, and soul into hell. Yes, exclamation point, fear him. 
Jesus wasn't shying away from the truth of the consequences of sin. He's teaching and telling and declaring and begging us. He's saying, do you understand? And sometimes I feel like we have to be like, yeah, I'm so sorry. The Bible talks about hell. And all I need to do in that regard is apologize to God for being, for mincing my own words that I'm telling you guys, every single one of you is conceived and born in sin. James 2.10 says that whoever keeps the whole law and stumbles at one point is guilty of all. But do you know what that one sin might be in your own life? That one sin in your own life might be relying on your own goodness to earn your favor before God. It doesn't have to be a lie or a lustful thought. It could be relying on your own goodness to earn your way to God. And that sin enough separates us from a holy God. And Jesus says the consequence of that is, is hell. And so we can't realize the good news of the gospel until we recognize the plight that we are under, that we have nothing to offer God, and that like the tax collector who says, God, be merciful to me, a sinner, that's who we are. That's what the, the point that we have to come to. We have to come to the point of the prodigal going, he came to the end of his senses. He's saying, I have nothing. I'm going to die here. I'm going to die here. And what you and I potentially have grown up with is such a, a diminished understanding of our sin that we theologically agree with the concept that I'm not perfect, but hardly ever have come to the point of going, God, I am a mess. I am a wreck. I am lost. I am done for. I need a savior. I'm helpless. I have nothing to offer you. And until you get to that point, you do not understand the gospel and you are not saved. You are not saved by merely saying, yeah, I'm a sinner. I agree with that verse. You are saved when you realize your lostness, that you and I have been born in sin. But not only that, we've continued to alienate ourselves from the Father who gave us life, who gives us hope, who gives us a home, who loves us. And we continue to, to drive him away in our sin. And the reason why we have such a diminished love and appreciation for the gospel and the reason why you become so apathetic in your own faith is potentially because you've never realized your lostness. You've never realized that you actually need a savior. Maybe you've said, yeah, God is my savior, Jesus is my friend, and I believe that he's mighty to save. But until you get to the point where you go, God must be mighty to save in order to save a sinner like me, then you don't get it. Then you don't get it. Romans 3.18, every mouth will be stopped before a holy God. But I think that if I was going to be honest with you, when I was 17, if I would have died, I would have had a lot to say when I met God face to face. I knew that he had mercy on whom he has mercy, but if he had mercy on whom he had mercy, then it makes sense that he had mercy on me. Because my sin all the, really wasn't that bad in comparison with other people. So the measure and value of our sin is compared against other Christians who compare themselves against other Christians who compare themselves to other Christians. Instead of comparing ourselves to the holy standard of God himself as revealed in his word. God doesn't mess around in here, and God never, never sweeps under the rug sin. And I love, we sing different songs, and we talk about pardon. Your sin and my sin is never pardoned. Your sin and my sin will always be paid for. God isn't sitting on his throne going, ah, forgiven, bye. No, he says, no, sin must be paid for. And it'll either be paid for by you, or it'll be paid for by a substitute. That's why you and I need a savior. That's why we need Jesus, and that's why we must cry out and go, God, be merciful to me, a sinner, because the only reason and the only way that you and I would ever meet God face to face and he would say, come on in, is because of a substitute who is perfect. And the reason why the gospel has lost its sweetness or never has had its sweetness in your life is because you've never come to the point of recognizing your total ruin before God. And what happened in social media world is the world has gotten smaller and you've begun to look at everybody else's sin and go, surely that's the prodigal. And all the while, you don't realize that in your own mind and in my own life as well, I've become the Pharisee going, God, I thank you that I'm not like them. Jesus looks at me and he potentially looks at you and says, you are more lost than him because you think that your goodness can save you. Jesus says your goodness must be repented of because you're relying on it as its own savior. And you're just as far and even more alienated from me. And the reason we need to come to our, our, the end of ourself is because God saves those who need a savior. He came to seek and to save the lost. And what he tells the Pharisees and what he tells us 2,000 years later is that it is the sick that need a doctor, not the well, not the healthy. Jesus comes as the good physician and heals the sick. Those who recognize their need 
And if you're in Christ and you've already been saved and you already know the truth, then praise God that you recognize your need and what you and I need to do is recall and recite who we are before Christ so that we can say, God, thank you for saving me. But if you've never come to that point, that's what you need more than anything on planet Earth. The gospel is not some sort of like um, flu shot that's like, yeah, you're okay now and the reason you're miserable is because you have a hole in your heart. The reason you're miserable is because of your sin and you need a savior from your sin. And I'm so sick and tired of us diminishing sin to just being like a couple bad things that we do. We are messed up. And I hear a lot of people say, I, I don't know, I'm just going to go with my gut on this one. I'm going to go with my heart on this one. Really? Your heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can know it? And the reason we need a Savior is because of that. And do you know what? No amount of preaching. I even rest, I, to be honest with you guys, I, I teach so much about sin that I go into it. I'm going, God, I pray that I would never teach out of familiarity. And so I'm okay with stumbling over my own words sometimes. You know why? Because I never want to be a robot. I never want to be a robot on stage and be like, yeah, 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 fluid, fluid, fluid. Amazing thought and perfectly placed words together. Here's what I'm wrestling with right now, is that if you don't ever recognize your sin biblically, you will never cry out for a savior. And if you do not do that, you will not be saved. And all of that comes from an understanding of who God is, that God is holy and perfect. And Jesus says in his word, be holy, for I am holy, and without holiness no man shall see the Lord. And that's what we need more than anything. I was going to Dubai um, a few months ago, and on the way to the airport, I uh, was with an, an Uber driver. Do you guys have Uber out here? Yeah, okay. So I, I asked my guy, I said, hey, what's your name? And he said, uh, my name is Michael. And I said, okay, Michael, uh, one of the, the quickest ways to share your faith is just to ask, hey, do you have any background in things of the Lord or any religious things? And he, he looks behind me. I'm, I always sit back right in the seat with Uber, just kind of the Jason Bourne in me. So I'm going like, hey, I, I know exactly how, how far this guy can run at this altitude. The, uh, so I go, hey, have you ever been acquainted with the things of the Lord or with religion? He looks behind me and goes, I'm glad you asked. I'm like, okay, you freak. You know, like, and he goes, uh, he says, uh, I'm 55 years old. And uh, I've only missed church four times in my entire life. And I was like, okay, Mr. Big Shot. You know, like, um, never got the cold, I guess. Uh, so he, I go, all right. So he, I said, really? And he goes, yeah, well, I'm a Mormon. And I said, okay, okay. You know, I've read a little bit about Mormonism, Michael, but um, what do you think is the main difference between what you believe and what I believe? And he looks around like he had read my mind that I was going to ask this question like five weeks before. And he goes, let me, uh, let me tell you by telling you this story. And I was like, okay. So he goes, imagine my daughter wants to buy an iPad. Here's an iPad. I think they're $599. It was given to me. It's actually not even mine. No, they're $599. Yeah. So he says, imagine my daughter wants to buy an iPad. Um, what you believe is that I would pay for all of it. What I believe is that I would tell my daughter to work as hard as she could to be resourceful, strategic, entrepreneurial, to save up as much money as she possibly can. So at the end of the year, my daughter goes up to the Apple counter at the Apple store and slams $31 down on the counter. And I'm going, your daughter is not an entrepreneur. You know, like, she sucks. You know, so like, puts $31 down on the counter. And what I do is I go up and I pay the rest. I pay the rest. This is what we often think about our relationship with God. We work and we work and we work. Maybe we're not the prodigal, but we're going to work our way to God. We know we need grace. We know we need mercy. But we put all of our good deeds on the counter, and God gives us the push into the end zone. And what Jesus says very clearly in his word is that if that's your mentality, your heart is far from God. And you don't get it. And what Jesus says to the prodigal is, there is no sin too great for God's mercy. Who are you to think that God can't forgive you? Are you calling God a liar? God says no sin is too great. You're all in the realm of God's mercy and his grace. And he forgives the most wicked of sinners. He forgives on the cross the thief next to him and says, today you'll be with me in paradise. And as the Romans nailed him to a tree, 
He says, Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them. There's no sin too great outside of the realm of God's forgiveness and his mercy and his grace. So if you're a prodigal in the room, you need a Savior. You need Jesus Christ. And you need the death, resurrection of Jesus who paid for our sin. If you're a Pharisee in the room, you're in a dangerous position because you know the truth, you know the answers. But you might have the same mentality as Michael, saying, I'll put my $31 on the table. But when it comes to your condition and my condition, we don't have $31 to offer God. We're not only spiritually impoverished, we're spiritually bankrupt with a debt that we can never, ever, ever pay. And when we recognize that and say we are helpless and have a debt that we could never, 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 ever, ever pay, that's the point to where we can cry out for a Savior. But we have to, like the prodigal in verse 17, he comes to the end of himself. He comes to his senses. Many of you, potentially, I just ask you, have you come to the end of yourself? Have you ever come to your senses and said, and really understood you have nothing to offer God? You cannot rob God of his own glory. And so in that, my prayer for you is that you would ask yourself, if I really ever realized and looked at my sin the way God does? And have I ever recognized and realized my lostness before God? Because you can never be found unless you realize you are lost. And you can never be made alive unless you realize and recognize that you are dead. And you will never need a savior unless you realize you need to be saved. This is what the Bible teaches. And I'll tell you, I think if I died when I was in high school, I don't know if I would have gone to see the Lord. Because I thought I knew everything. I was a good kid, knew the answers, knew the truth. And Jesus says, you're all put on an equal playing field. Prodigal and Pharisee, you both equally need a savior. And you need to come to the end of yourself. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. For your word, God, I pray that your spirit would move even amongst and amidst my own um, weaknesses at times, communicatively. God, I feel uh, like I'm fumbling a minute over over my words. Uh, but Lord, I uh, I recognize that the people that realize and are starting to perceive their own lostness are not doing so because of anything that I've said. That's because of your spirit moving in their life. God, you're, you're, you're moving in their hearts and you're the only one that can show someone their great need for you. And if they're thinking that right now, it's not in their own heads that they've conjured that up but it's something that you do in our own hearts and lives to recognize our sin and realize our need for you. God, that's what we need more than anything is a savior. God, so many people think that they can be their own savior, and although they might biblically affirm that you are a savior, they've been living a life trying to be their own. And as long as we are living our life trying to be our own savior, we can never have any assurance of our standing before you because our assurance will always be based on who we are and what we've done. And God, when we look at who we are and what we've done in light of your own holiness, the only result will be a, a total insecurity about our position before you. And so God, we're thankful that your mercy and grace and love extends to the worst of sinners, but also calls the Pharisees to repent, not only of their badness, but their goodness that thinks that earns them favor before you. God, we love you. We praise you in your name. And all God's people said, amen. Love you.